this crowd here. And so I'm just going to preach you a little old simple message this morning, just on a little old simple nothing this morning. Bring you some milk. <laughs> I'm going to preach you a message in the plan. Job 16. Bob Jones Sr. told me years ago, he said, he said, Pete, uh, you're not going to get many people to follow you with the strong emphasis you put on the Bible. But he said, you need to remember it's always good sometimes just to feed some folks some milk and strong meat's good, but it won't do for a steady diet. Once in a while, the Lord's people just need some, some milk. <laughs> so that's what you're going to get this morning. Acts chapter 16, beginning at verse 25. Now, this, uh, this monkey suit I'm in is not because I'm Jim Jones or Jimmy Swaggart. <laughs> I've got just one suit like this I bought up in Austria, and uh, I must have been about 15 miles from where the fellow was who wrote Sign at Night when we came back from that trip. We came back to our breakfast garden, coming back from Bodish, and went by within about eight miles where that old boy wrote Sign at Night off down the road down. enough time to go down to see the place we wanted to. And uh, this is Austrian clothes, good winter clothes, a good and warm. I stepped out of my house this morning in my Austrian suit and saw my German Volkswagen beneath my Bavarian flag, and I said, why stop firing? <laughs> I mean, you got German weather this morning, man. All right, Acts 16, verse 25. <laughs> Acts 16, verse 25. And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundation of the prison was shaken. And immediately all the doors were open, everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword, would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners had been fled. He supposed the right thing. When all the doors in Slam City come open, everybody's bars come off, nobody's going to stay. <laughs> I mean, that, that jailer had been a jailer for years. He figured if all the doors were open, all the chains were loose, everybody's gone. I mean, when you're in jail, all you want to do is get out. Now, whether you know it or not, but if you have much jail ministry, you know what they tell you. They want you to contact so-and-so, and could you write so-and-so, and the governor, and I got a false trial, and they accused me wrong, and this, if you're in the slammer, you only got one obsession, that's how to get out. And if all the doors are open, all the chains are gone, you're gone. And so the jailer figures they're all gone. I might as well kill myself because they're going to kill me anyway, like they do in Acts 12. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm. We are all here. All the prisoners still in jail. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out outside the jail and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, find the church that Christ founded and take the sacraments. <coughs> no, I didn't say that. They said, uh, pray to Mary and die in a state of grace. No, they said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. For the they didn't say any of that. That's just all this baloney you get in America. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake to him the word of the Lord. See, there's more to it than just... Just belief in the sense of believe. You had to know what to believe and how to believe. And they said, they spake him the word of the Lord to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. They'd been whipped and was baptized. He and all his straight way. When he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. None of his household were baptized without believing. Believing in God with all his house. Now, Father, bless the message this morning. And I don't know why you've laid this man on my heart today, but there must be some here that need this message this morning. Now I pray to be so clear that a wayfaring man, though a fool, may not err therein. And uh, these things that you've written that are simple will be plain and understandable this morning, and there won't be any haze or doubt or confusion in anyone's mind that leaves here today about how to get to heaven, how to see thee with favor at death. And I pray it in your name. Amen. Amen. Now this jailer asks what I call the most important question in the Bible. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The Bible is a strange book. You know that if you read it a good many times. And it has all kinds of questions. If any book in the world ministers questions, the Bible does. For example, the Bible will say, If a man die, shall he live again? That's quite a question. I'll tell you another question. What shall it profit a man if he gain his, the whole world lose his own soul? That's quite a question. I'll tell you another good question. 
What then shall I do with Jesus, which is called Christ? The Bible is always putting questions to you. And this question here is, sirs, what must I do to be saved? In the context, Paul and Silas have gone to jail. They've been whipped with an inch of their life. And when the jailer comes in and finds everybody there thinking they're gone, he knows a miracle has been done. I know this jailer had heard Paul and Silas preach because anybody that sings praise the God at midnight when they're in their stock in the stocks has not been a witness with a closed mouth. When you find a fellow gets thrown in jail and he starts singing in jail, he was singing before he ever got in jail. And you take that flipping jailer, he knew, he knew, he'd heard, he heard these fellows preach on the street. And if you didn't hear them preach on the street, he heard them when they were booked. And if you didn't hear them when they were booked, he heard them when they got thrown in the clink. And if you didn't hear them, he sure heard them at night down there saying, Praise God in whom all blessings flow. So when he, this earthquake takes place, he's already shook up. And when he finds the prisoners haven't gone, he's really shook up. And so he brings them out there and asks them a question that's already on his heart. And says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, there's some things you can't do to be saved. You cannot be sprinkling water to be saved. You cannot join a church to be saved. You cannot follow Buddha and Muhammad to be saved. Folks say, what about all those folks? I'm very sorry about that. Why don't you do something about that? Folks go overseas, they say, well, you mean to tell me you people are right, that else is wrong? Listen, friend, you got English time right now. If you got any other time, you got the wrong time. I get so tired of these people thinking a person is bigoted or dogmatic or narrow-minded because they say there's only one way to be saved when there's only one way to tell time. Isn't this strange? If you got time now in, in line with the Greenwich Observatory in England, you've got the right time, and if you're a minute off that time, you've got the wrong time. That's all there is to it. And I'm here to say that Jesus Christ is the way and the truth and the life, and you may have a great deal of respect for other folks' religion, you may have a great deal of sympathy with their beliefs, and you may try very hard to justify them because you want to, but if you have Christ, you have the right Savior, and if you have any other Savior, you've got the wrong one. Amen. All right, now I want to say four things about this question. First of all, it was a polite question. You notice the text? Sirs, sirs, what must it do to be saved? You don't find people talking like that much anymore. I got a friend up in Illinois named Bobby Buddy Weeks who was witnessing up there, and Buddy Weeks knocked at the door of the guy's house and said, would you like to come to church? He said, I already belong to two churches. He said, which are they? He said, I belong to a Baptist church and a Methodist church. He said, why do you belong to two of them? He said, if one can't get me to heaven, the other one can. <laughs> And Buddy Weeks said, well, do you know for certain where you're going when you die? And the guy said, no, and I'm not interested. Bam, and slammed the door. Some manners. Yeah. Folks call a Campbellite or a Mormon or a, or a Jehovah Witness. I tell you, and I've got to teach people manners. Folks are in rough shape, you know that? <laughs> now, if some of you can't say amen all week, you can say amen to that. Amen, amen, amen. amen. I had a friend one time, I knocked the door of a house, and the guy came to the door, and this guy said, are you saved? And the guy said, ah, ha, 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 bam, and slammed the door on him. Just laughed, slammed the door in his face. He said, well, how do you handle a thing like that? I said, I guess the way to handle me, laugh right back. Or when you stop the guy and slam the door, he goes, ah, ha, ha, you stand there and go, ah, ha, 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 ha. He'd probably take the guy back so far, he'd probably stop and ask you what you're laughing at, you know, and then you can say, what are you laughing at? <laughs> <laughs> People are there, they get more rude with the years. These kids saying, uh, all the time, huh, huh. I guess I'm tired of hearing that, huh. Yeah, yeah. Do something, huh, huh. You mean ma'am, you mean sir? Yeah. You mean yes, sir, you mean no, sir? Yeah. They got one of these kids in these Christian schools, and the guy said, Have you raised in a Christian school? And he said, Uh huh. <laughs> so they teach at that school, they teach us to be polite and say, Yes, sir, and no, sir. Do they really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't teach him nothing. The kid puts on that stuff while he's at the school. As soon as he gets out of the school, he puts on what he wants to put on. I mean, talk about rudeness. I've had our young men stop a guy down the street and say, Sir, would you take a gospel track? Don't bother me, son. Well, what, 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 what are you, a man or something with manners like that? I take a tract if a Jehovah Witness gives it to me. Seventh day Adventist give me a tract. I say, Thank you, I'll read it. Have one of mine. See? But don't bother me. What a thing. We have guys come down here, some come down from up north, you know, that have manners that I mean, I'm honest to goodness, we, we, uh, we know uh, Dorothy Dix or somebody here to teach you something. 
And like I said, when I have to teach a man, a man in rough shape, I've had, to sit, I've had to sit on a table at a restaurant with some of my young men and teach them manners, eating out in public. Honest to God, man. We had a couple of guys down here one time up north from Ohio, and I mean, they uh, the waitress asked them what they want. Uh, yeah, no, you know, bring me some sugar. You know, bring me some tea. Yeah, no, uh-huh, uh-uh, you know. And, you know, it may be a trial to go through, but you can, you can, you can, you can act polite anyway, see. And, they, you know, they want to get napkins at the table in my house. They're throwing a roll of toilet paper across the, the uh, table for napkins, you know. Have some biscuits. <laughs> the biscuit goes down there in the thing. Well, that may be all right, a bunch of men messing around. But, I mean, if you've got uh, company, it should be half genteel anyway, you know. <laughs> amen, amen. I've gone, I've gone, I've gone vis visiting down in, uh, in St. Louis, Missouri with Hal Rawlings, uh, Brother Rawlings' son down there, and we've had doors slam their face down there. We went to a dozen homes where they never even opened the door. I mean, they opened the door that far with a night, night latch on it, talked you through the door, wouldn't take a track, and then slam the door. Rude people. Rude people. It's a polite question. Sirs, what must do to be saved? It's a polite question. Not a rude question. I, I remember when I was under conviction, I was just like all my generation, just rude and uncouth. I ran into a Catholic church down here and grabbed that priest by the hash and said, I'm looking for something. You got it? <laughs> I mean, what, a, what, a, what an inquiry, you know. <laughs> I'm looking for something. You got it? <laughs> of course, I probably was led by the Lord. That fellow knocked the ashes off his stogie and said, well, it'll depend on what you're looking for, my boy. <laughs> you know, so I probably had the right man, but that's no way to go about it. I believe I be the greatest thing I ever knew in my life in personal work. I ran into him Bobby Ware's church down in Orlando. The guy down there later on we became great friends, and he got me some good uh, material from the wall and sent me a good double-headed eagle I put over my fireplace. But that guy was an unsaved man, about 30, with a family. And one day when I came into the, the uh, vestibule of the church there before uh, preaching, that fellow stopped me, and he said, Sir, would you please lead me to Jesus Christ? Wow. Man, I wasn't sure I could there for a minute. You know, that thing just paralyzes you, man. Sir, would you please leave me to Jesus Christ? Will I? <laughs> but you live in a great age with a great crudeness and great uncouthness and great rudeness, especially by people who profess to be cultured and have manners. You bring up Christ in the Bible, you see how thin-skinned their manners are, brother. How so they suddenly lose all their or their equilibrium. Out there in the gold rush in 1949 when they had those um, planks across the streets in Frisco with mud a foot deep and rough crude men, drunkards and brawlers around those towns. One big old tough start across the boardwalk there out in the middle of that street and ran by a Chinese laundryman with a pile of laundry in his head and just knocked him off into the mud and went on by. And that Chinaman got up in that mud and rubbed himself off and said, excuse me, so sorry, you Christian, me heathen. <laughs> That's about it. That's about it. That's about it. It's a polite question. You here this morning, you're unsaved. Well, you can burr up and ruffle up and get hot around the collar and hair stand up back your head and get mad and upset with me. But I'll tell you something, if you're a gentleman or if you're a lady, you'll be polite about it. Don't talk to me about being a gentleman and being a lady where some of you folks act when you get in a tight, get something you don't like. Don't preach to me. Shut your mouth. I got you read out right. Think of sometimes I'm just a little bit more open than other folks are. I understand it. Number two, it was a practical question. What could be more practical than being prepared to die? Amen. You any more practical than that? What's more practical than getting ready for the undertaker? You all going to make it. The Lord tarries. If you're unsaved, you're going to make it with the Lord tires or whether he did. Practical question. Bob Jones, see, he used to say religion is reliance. What do you mean by that? He meant your religion is what you rely upon, what you count on, what you trust in, what you depend upon. That's your religion. Do you count on somebody, depend upon somebody, rely upon that person wholly? That's your religion. Religion is reliance. Religion is what a man leans on. I'm relying on this pulpit to hold me up. That's my religion. I don't care what a fellow says his religion is, what he's relying on, that's his true religion. And if you're here this morning, if you're relying on anything but the shed blood of Jesus Christ, you're relying on something that won't hold you up. Right. Religion is reliance. 
Folks say, all these preachers, these Bible-thumping preachers and the hell and heaven and the salvation, all that stuff, is so impractical. Give us something practical. Like what? A trip to the moon? <laughs> you call that practical? You call it practical to fight communism in Vietnam when you can fight it in the Senate? <laughs> You call it practical to fight communism in San Salvador and Honduras when you can fight it in the Parent Teachers Association? Practical, practical. What does this world know about practicality? You call it practical to give millions of dollars to Francisco Franco in Spain when he was a Roman Catholic dictator and at the same time fight against Mussolini? That's practical, is it? You call it practical to send the Marines to Palestine to defend the PLO against the terrible Jews and 300 of them get killed and you can't even fire a shot back? That's practical, is it? <laughs> Your father's mustache, man. Why, this world knows nothing about practicality. The most practical thing in the world is getting ready to die. You can't beat that. You can't beat that. All this stuff about human rights, civil rights, children's rights, civil liberty union, out there in Nebraska like we talked about this morning, there's seven men in jail for trying to send their kids to a Christian school. You call that practical? Human rights, NACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People? How about the advancement of the white folks? <laughs> All that stuff like just impractical, theoretical, socialistic nonsense. But you folks, how we stop inflation, increase the interest rate, lower the... Listen, man, the inflation is controlled by the Federal Reserve Bank, and that's a privately owned corporation. No man can control inflation. You can hold it back if a bunch of folks go out of work. <laughs> but if it's just booming the dump of the paper money, and you go right back in again. I get sick and tired of the world criticizing us Bible-believing preachers for being impractical. We're the most practical people on the face of this earth. About 14 Christmas ago, I was down here at Trailer Court, down on uh, North Davis, about a block up north of Kmart, a fellow named Burkholder in there, him and his wife. He's about 60. She's about 58. No kids. Him dying. He wasn't saved. Wife was saved. I got in that trailer there, no heat in that trailer about this time of year. It wasn't this cold. It was about 28. Little old Christmas tree there on the table, about 8 inches high. A little old dime store Christmas tree, a couple of little silver balls on it, and artificial candle, sardine can, half open, crackers, black coffee lying around there. I guess he might have had three dresses. He didn't have any suit. Fellow sitting there hacking his guts out, a little old stone opening air in his throat. He'd talk to you and say, Come in, Mother Ruckman, sit down. He'd sit there smoking a cigarette through that thing. All the stuff that's part of the so gone. He had about, I guess, about three weeks to live. We're going to talk to him about the Lebanon situation. Trying to vote for ERA. Bunch of stupid asses going down this country. What do you know about what's practical? So I'm talking about who's going to play in the Super Bowl this year? <laughs> got out there in the trailer about that fellow, let him to Christ. Old boy got saved. He lived about four weeks. About four weeks, I went out to Naval Air Station at his funeral, military funeral, didn't have any money for anything else, been in the service World War II, 12 people there, 12 people at that funeral. What a thing. Let me ask you, what could be more practical for that fellow than getting ready to die? He didn't have any friends, didn't have any money, didn't have a house, didn't have land, didn't have clothes, didn't have a job, didn't have a future, didn't have any health. What could be more practical than getting ready to die? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's a practical question. One time over there going down to one of those Welsh mines in England, and the Welsh miners, uh, they're notorious for being saved and singing hymns. It was the day of Whitfield. And an army officer, a godless profane army officer, was going down one of those shafts there about 1910 with a bunch of miners, cussing and telling dirty jokes. The miners just standing there looking at him. Now, after I got down there a couple of hundred feet on the ground, that officer not getting a response. So if you fellows work so far down, how much further is it to the bottomless pit? One of those old black-faced miners said, Well, I don't know, but if the cable broke, you'd be there in about a second. <laughs> That's practical. <laughs> what could be more practical than being ready in case a cable broke? <laughs> it's a practical question. I say number three, it's a personal question. 
Notice the question, sirs, what must I do to be saved? No we, no we. There are nothing there like Acts 2.37. In Acts 2.37, those Jews said, men and brethren, what must we do? That ain't the question. The question is, sirs, what must I do to be saved? People are always trying to mess up the terminology. Jesus Christ talking to a fellow one night, and he says, uh, Verily, verily, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know, that fellow answers him. He says, Well, how can a man be born again? Hey, buddy, how come you didn't say, How can I be born again? You saw they switch that thing? The Lord says that fellow, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again. And he says, well, how can a man? You want to get it objective, don't you? You want to push it off from you, don't you? You want to talk about somebody else, don't you? Now, if he said, except a man be born again, he's talking to a man. Why didn't the man say, well, Lord, how can I be born again? But he says, how can a man? Shall they duck that thing? Always trying to make the thing impersonal. It's personal. Listen, you'll never be saved. Uh, do you understand what I'm talking about applies to you? That's why I point my finger at people when I preach. That's why I look them in the eye when I preach. I want you to get a personal application. I want you to understand the message for you, not the person behind you. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Until you're under conviction, you're never going to be saved. I read a beautiful story in one of my books someplace about a bunch of little girls playing church. Five or six of them. The eleven-year-old was going to preach. <laughs> and girls play church too, you know, like boys do. And she got up and preached and preached herself under conviction. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, but when she got the invitation, she said, Anybody like to come forward and receive Jesus Christ? And she said, I will, <laughs> and went down to her knees and got saved. <laughs> now, you know what that is? That's a personal application. It's always harder to do it in a crowd than it is with one or two. Uh, Brother Hiles tells about a couple of fellows he had up there in Texas. One fellow's name was Carmen Hatchfield, converted Mexican. The other guy was Cortez, converted Mexican. And one afternoon, they decided they'd practice preaching. So they got there in the empty church on Saturday afternoon, about two out in the afternoon, and Carmen got up to preach, and Cortez was the audience. And Carmen got up there and said, Either repent, you're going to hell. <laughs> you know, and Cortez said, Amen, amen. You need to be born either this Christ. Amen, amen. One guy. And they went on that way for about 15 minutes, and there was a guy coming home from football practice that afternoon about 3 o'clock, and he came by the door of that church and heard that thing in there. Or that one guy preached and that one guy said, Amen, Amen. He couldn't figure out what it was. And he came in the back and stood there and saw that thing and was just hypnotized. Big church, see 400 people, two people in it. One guy in the pulpit, one guy in the back. Amen, Amen. And that football player, just he couldn't, he just slipped in the back seat and just sat there and listened. <laughs> he got saved. The invitation, anybody here want to be saved? I put his hand down. He came and got saved. You say, why is that? He took it personally, brother. It's pretty hard, you know, there's only two of you there, you know, and one guy said, Amen, you're not saying anything. Pretty hard to miss the message. That personal witness, the best one. We had a lady in our church one time, her name was Mrs. Munt, Harry Munt's wife, and she was a real witness. She was a character. She get down to the Catholic hospital, she's down there one day, and a Catholic, she witnessed anybody. That Catholic priest came down there and, you know, came to the room, how are you doing, my daughter, and so forth and so on. And she said, fine. She said, do you know where you're going when you die? <laughs> and he swelled up, you know, like a toad full of buckshot, and said, and said, do you know who I am? Yeah. And she said, yes. <laughs> and he said, well, then pray for me. And she said, all right, I will, and bow her head and pray right in front of him, and ask God to save him. One of our fellows in the hospital down there one time, the priest came around and said, God bless you, my son. He looked him right in the face and said, you're not old enough to be my father. <laughs> <laughs> we had a lady down there one time. Her name was, uh, what was her name? That missionary went over to Japan, the glasses. Lacoste. Lacoste, yeah, Mrs. Lacoste. She got in a car wreck down there and got real beat up bad. A lot of stitches taken on her and went to the hospital. About the second night she dared on the Catholic hospital, the Catholic nun going down the hallway heard her. Her, her, her say, I'm soaking in blood, I'm floating in blood. And that nurse like that, a fit boy, I mean, ringing the bell, run down the hood, but come down the one ain't blood in there. Asked her, where's the blood? She said, the blood of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty rough, you know, after all, you have to blow and you talk about the confraternity of the precious blood and all that, you know. 
and then you got a patient on him what the thing refers to. You know, one of these days you'll be gone, and I'll be gone for Lord Darius, and then, bless my soul, you'll know experimentally whether you're right or whether you're wrong. One of these days you're going to die, and one day you're going to drop your chain and go up to glory. You're going to pick up your chain, go down to hell, and you're going to go up, shout, and glory to God, or go down cursing one or the other. And you know experimentally what I'm, what I'm talking about. You'll be glorifying God and gnashing your teeth depending upon what you did with Jesus Christ. I won't be around to harass you anymore and give you a hard time. You'll know whether you got it right or whether you got it wrong. You say, why? It's personal. It's personal. Did you ever ask somebody for directions and get all confused? I mean, suppose you stood up right now and said, Ruckman, can you tell me how to get home to heaven and see God's face with favor? And I would say, yes, sir, I certainly can. You say, how do I know you're telling the truth? I said, because I tried it and it worked. You know what people do? They pay preachers to tell them things they don't even know about. You take in Pensacola this morning and Sunday morning, you got people down here in Episcopal churches and Catholic churches and Holy churches where they're putting money in a plate and bringing that money down there to pay the salary of a fellow in the pulpit who don't even know where he's going when he dies. Amen. Ain't that a strange thing? Amen. I mean, if you ever have trouble with your car, don't come around me and ask me to tell you how to get it fixed. Boy, I'll tell you how to grind your valves. Put a grenade in a man and blow him up. <laughs> I don't think about that kind of stuff. Now you understand that, but why do some of you folks a laugh would go to a preacher to know where he was going to find out how to get to heaven? Why is that? The strangest thing. Jonathan Winters has a, has a little monologue where he says, Do you ever go to a town and ask a fellow and say, Do you know how to get to uh, Mulberry Bridge? And the fellow gets kind of a far away look in his eyes and says, Mulberry Bridge, oh gee, well, see, you know, he doesn't know where it's at, never been there. I think that's about, uh, you stranger around these parts, oh, yeah, I'm a stranger, don't care if I ever come back. <laughs> well, you go down here about four or five miles, and you take a right, or it's a left, and you come to a red bridge, you painted last year, and you cross over there about a mile, it seems like it's a mile, maybe about a quarter of a mile. He don't know nothing, man, he don't know where he's going. How do you get saved? No, you tell your beads. Call on the Virgin. Take the sacraments. Go get sprinkled. Turn over a new leaf. Live the golden rule. Treat folks right. Join a church. You don't know where you're going. All you're doing is confusing folks. You ever ask somebody for directions after 15 minutes you're more confused than you were when you started? Well, folks ask us what must do to be saved, and after 15 centuries of church history, they have a less idea than ever had before. Somebody confused them. Aesop said the animals got together one time, and the real smart one said, why don't we teach our skills to the other animals? So they got together, and they taught the eagle how to swim, and they taught the squirrel how to whistle, and they taught the dog how to climb a tree, and they taught a duck how to run. <laughs> <laughs> and don't you know that was a scurvy-looking crew when they got gone? A duck can't learn how to run. And if you've never been there yourself, how can you tell somebody else? You can't tell them. I know I'm saved. I know whom I have believed. I am persuaded he's able to keep that triumph committed him against that day. Brother Rice one time was preaching to a fellow called Hayes, in a place called Hayson, Mississippi. And he talked to a fellow there, a Catholic fellow in that town, who was a real bitter man and mad at the church and everybody, and he got a conversation going with him. And he said, uh, you sure have a fine family. He said, yeah, we got seven children now. And Brother Rice said, you say, now, did you have more than that? He said, yes, we had eight. He said, we had a little old three-year-old girl. So she's the prettiest girl, the smartest one in the whole bunch, and she got drowned in the Mississippi River. And then Brother Rice tried to lead that guy to Christ and sat him down and said, now listen, you can see your little old girl again, and someday you're going to see a little girl in heaven, and I'll show you how to trust Jesus Christ. You can believe on Christ, you'll see your little girl again. The fellow said, no, I won't. And Rice said, yes, you will. You can see your girl in heaven. No, she's not in heaven. And Brother Rice said, what do you mean by that? He said, it's impossible to never see my little girl again. He said, you see, she wasn't baptized.
she hadn't been baptized, denied her burial in a Catholic cemetery. You know what that is? That's somebody that doesn't know where they're going or how to get there trying to tell somebody else. You're not going to see you a three-year-old girl. Of course, you've never been baptized. That's somebody saying, well, you go down there about four miles, come to Red Bridge and paint last year. He don't know where he's at. He don't know where he's at. All right, it's a personal question. It's a polite question. It's a powerful question. That's the most powerful question you can ask, and the, the answer to that is the most powerful name in the universe. Sirs, what must it be say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that thing? Lord, that's God the Father. Jesus, that's God the Son. Christ, Christos, anointed, that's the Holy Spirit. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe what? Believe that Jehovah is God, that Jehovah saves, that Jehovah came down here in the flesh as a man and died for your sins. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. It only has one answer. There are three questions in the book of Acts. First question, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Go into the city, it shall be told thee what thou shalt do. That's for a Christian. Men and brethren, what must we do? That's the Jew. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the remission of sins. Third question, unsaved man. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Answer, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. There's only one answer. The answer is Jesus Christ. I'm sure I'm talking to a lot of people who know that. You need to be reminded of it. There's one way. It's Jesus Christ. There isn't any other way. Up there in Ottawa, Tennessee, one time, there was a Catholic up there that uh, wrote to an editor of a large Christian magazine and said, Sir, you write so good and you are love God so much, it's apparent by your writings that you would be a blessing to the Catholic Church. Why don't you join the Catholic Church that I belong to where God can use you? And the editor wrote him back a letter and said, uh, Dear so-and-so, appreciate your letter. The reason why I do not join the Catholic Church is, first of all, because no Catholic knows where he's going for sure when he dies. And secondly, because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10 that Christ offered one sacrifice for sins forever. I'm not going to join a church where you have a sacrifice every Sunday morning. And the Catholic wrote that editor back and said, Dear sir, you're wrong about your position. We Catholics know where we're going when we die, and I can prove it. And that Catholic young man, about 90 years old, went to his priest and said, Can't we know where we're going when we die? And the priest said, No, you can't. You can't know unless you die in a state of grace. He went to his bishop and said, Don't Catholics know where they're going to die? He said, Nobody can know except a few canonized saints, and the rest of us have to wait till we're dead. Then he wrote to the archbishop and said, Don't we know where we're saved where we're going? The archbishop said, No, nobody can know for certain until the dead. He ran into that. He went back to his local priest. <clears throat> and he came back in there and said, Why do you tell me this stuff when the Bible says there's one sacrifice for sins forever? Who are you to say we should keep offering our sacrifice when the Bible says only once? And the priest said, Who are you to interpret the Bible for yourself when the church was given that job and slapped him in the face? And that fellow went home and got saved and left the Catholic Church. <laughs> Smart man. Smart man. But it's a powerful question. That fellow got persecuted after he got saved, like some of you have been persecuted and will be persecuted. And the reason why is you're dealing with power. Power, man. Jesus Christ. Power. It's a powerful question. An old mission bum went down to the mission one time, went down the altar and got there and knelt there for a while. And the mission worker came by and said, ask him to save you right now. And he said he won't do it. And the mission worker said he will too. And the guy said, I'm a blankety blank, couldn't be saved. He said, what are you doing here? He said, I don't want to go to hell. And the mission worker said, we're going to ask God to save you. And that fellow prayed, oh God, if you can save a sinner like me, why in hell don't you do it right now? <laughs> <laughs> and he looked up from the altar, a kind of funny look came across his face. He looked down the altar, the other fellows were, and he said, boys, he did it. <laughs> <laughs> You say, what is that? That's power, brother. That's power. The most powerful question in the world is, what must it do to be saved? You know why most people don't get saved? They don't feel like the lost. You say, oh, how about these millions of people all around the world, brother Ruffin, that don't hear this and don't know? They don't think they're lost. When a man knows he's lost, he'll find some way to find Jesus Christ. 
I got a, I'm getting letters. I'm getting letters there almost every month from the central, from Central Africa, from Ghana and Liberia. I probably ought to keep those things and put them in a the book. Some guy down there, 15 years ago, found one of my tracks in the jungle and got saved, and he told all his buddies about it, and they've been writing me for literature ever since. <clears throat> I've got down, I've sent out a half a dozen times to Ghana, still a mail over there, and the first letter said this, Dear Jesus Man, I'm just written in child characters, me Jesus boy too, me find your picture in jungle, me get saved. Me want Jesus book. <laughs> I sent it to him. <laughs> Three years later, I got a postmark from the same place for some other guy. These names, you know. Lowumba Mumba Gumba, you know. Habba Gabba Jutu, you know. <laughs> Cassius Clay, you know, that kind of thing. And, 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 and I got a letter about three years later, and about four years later, and this year I got two letters from two other fellows. I don't know who they are. They come from the same place, two other guys. Dear, the letter's getting better now, they're getting legible, you know. Dear, uh, dear Dr. Ruckman, please send me books. I read some of your books. Your book's very helpful. Me have no money. Can you help me out with some books? I want to learn more about the Lord coming through there. Listen, if a fellow wants to find Christ and get right, he can find Christ and get right. And the reason why people aren't saved, they don't think they're lost. You don't think you're bad. You think you're good. You think you're good. Let me tell you something. If some of you young people here this morning had to look your mother right straight in the eye, right straight in the eye, and tell her the thoughts that have gone through your head for the last 48 hours, you would pass out. And the only way you could do it would be lie about it. I'll tell you something else. Some of you men, some of you men here, you might maybe even look your wife in the eye and tell her all you know that God knows about you. Or you wise your husbands. You don't tell me you're good. I don't believe you. Been around too long. All the sin comes toward the glory of God. You don't think you're lost just because you haven't met bottom yet. A fellow came to Bob Jones singing one time in a meeting, and he woke him up in the afternoon when he was trying to take a nap and said, I've got to talk to you. And Bob Jones Sr. called him in. He sat down there in the hotel room with the bed by him, and he said, Now listen, I've got to get this off my chest. So I've lost 25 pounds. I can't sleep. I'm getting where I can't eat. I've got no peace of mind for eight years. I want to tell you about this. And he said, I want to get saved, and I want to tell you about this first. And he said, about uh, eight years ago, he said, my wife left me, went off to another man, left me with three children. A little old girl about eight, a little boy about ten, and a little three-year-old girl who was blind and an idiot, a moron. And he said, I was left to raise those three kids by myself, and I got where I hated that little blind girl, couldn't stand her, and busting up the fellowship out of the other two. And he said, a man of mine would kill her. This little blind girl trusted me and said, I told her, honey, I'm going to town and get you some candy. And she smiled and nodded her head. And he said, I went downtown and got some candy and came back and held out to her and said, honey, this is good to eat. Go ahead and eat it. And he said, I can still see her little old blind eyes, sight for sockets, looking at me, and her little old bony hand stretching out. And smiled and took that candy and ate it. So it was poison. killed her. And it's been eight years ago. He said, I haven't been able to sleep, do anything. At night I go to sleep. I saw a little blind eyes looking at me and a little smile on the hand reaching out like that. And he said, I've got to do something. I'm going crazy, losing my mind. You say, well, Brother Ruffin, I'm not like that. The Bible says there's no difference. No difference. Oh, Brother Ruffin, I wouldn't do a thing like that. You do something else. You say, I wouldn't. You can never be saved then. Do you see that? Bible says all of sin comes short of the glory of God. There is no difference. And the reason why folks don't get saved is they think there is a difference. You sit there and say, oh, well, I wouldn't do a thing like that. No, but let me tell you something. You're not going to have to look into, you know, your mother's face, your wife's face. You're going to have to look in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what i got to remember. Years ago, one of those old time camp meetings, an uh, old Methodist evangelist died and right before he died, he said he had a dream about judgment. And he said the white throne judgment was there, and they're calling out the name. And he said he came up there and was about to say something. And about that time, his presiding elder got up, an old-time Methodist bishop, and got up there and said, there's nothing against him. He said, that's what those old-time Methodists used to do. They'd meet every year or so and have all the preachers and pastors brought in for the conference. 
and they'd get up there and bring up charges against him if something was wrong. There was nothing against the fellow. The old-time Methodist bishop would say there's nothing against him. And that fellow dreamt he died, got up for the judgment, and his presiding elder got up and said there's nothing against him. Wouldn't it be one if you could hit the judgment and your doctor take your blood test and stand up and say nothing against him? And your lawyer that handled your personal file will stand up there and say there's nothing against him? And your wife, your husband that checked your fidelity could stand up there and say, I've got nothing against him. That'd be something, wouldn't it? That'd be great to have everybody say that. But that won't do. That won't do. You know what you got to have? You got to have Jesus Christ stand up there and say, I got nothing against him. I got nothing against him. And you're not going to have that. You're not going to have that until you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. What you to be saved? Must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. In thy house. An old time Puritan preacher had a dream about the judgment one time, and he said he died, went up there, and the white throne judgment took place, and the books were open. He was standing up there, wondering what in the world he was going to do. And finally, his name was called, and he couldn't stand. He said, I was kneeling there and shivering in terror and couldn't even look up, and there wanted anybody to stand for me. And he said, About that time, the Lord Jesus Christ stepped in there and said, I'll stand up for him. And he said, in the dream, I looked up, and I said, Lord, how can you stand up for a vile, depraved sinner like me? And he said, the Lord looked at him, and he said, I'll tell you what, I'll make a contract with you. I'll sign a contract with you. You stand it for me down there, and I'll stand for you up here. That's a good contract. All right, Father, bless the message this morning. I pray the Holy Spirit of God will apply the words of truth here today. If anybody here is unsaved, I pray this might be the birthday of their soul. They might trust the Lord Jesus Christ and understand there's one way, the one that said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. May they abandon all hope in anything else, anybody else, and put their faith in the risen Son of God. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's stand. Before we leave here this morning, I don't know if there's any unsaved here or not, but before we leave here this morning, let's sing this hymn we sang earlier here today. Let's sing, uh, Why Not Now? Why Not Now on the hymnal? And uh, before you go, 248, before you go, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ. You know, this is Christmas time. And one time, a Sunday school teacher got up to Christmas time. He said to his junior pupils, he said, I'm going to write a sentence on the board, and you finish it for me. And he wrote down, Christmas means, left a big blank. And the first kid raised his hand and said, presents. So he wrote down P-R-E-S-C-E-N-C-E. -E -E. And the kid said, I didn't mean that kind of presents. I meant like gifts. <laughs> and the teacher said, it is a gift. Folks, it's not, at this time of year, it's not P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S. -E -E it's P-R-E-S-C-E. -E M-C-E. His presence. <laughs> His presence. Though Christ in Bethlehem a thousand times be born, if he be born not in thee, thy soul is still forlorn. Let's sing, why not now? Sing out. Oh, while we pray and while we plead, Somebody here this morning, whether you ever thought about it or not, but somebody here this morning, this one of the few times of the year, your mind is going to be turned toward these things. I don't think much of Christmas and Easter as pagan holidays, but I'll tell you one thing, at that time of year, the mind gets turning that way. That's where the Lord got me, Christmas of 1948, outside of, an, of a manger scene in front of a Catholic church. That was the beginning of my salvation. In three months, I was saved. I guess when you get there, you remember those hymns when you were a little boy, you know, being raised? My favorite hymn was always, O oh, little town of Bethlehem, I'll still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by.
The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. When I was a boy, I used to sleep under the Christmas tree at night. That was my place to sleep. When I was about 10 years old, they got me a typewriter. It wasn't a real one. One where you turn the letter around, you know, the rubber thing, and then push it in and we get the ink stamp pad on it. That's the first typewriter I ever had. I was in the house the other day and heard the typewriter going pip 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 I got thinking about those snowy nights out there in that tree and those lights and everybody singing joy to the world. I had no joy. There's something like that here this morning, probably. You haven't got it, man. You haven't got it. You haven't got the presence. And the presence is a gift. Amen? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You have wandered far away, sing it. You have wandered far away. Let's bow our heads for a little word of prayer. Let's pray a while while the musicians are playing. Anybody here this morning, you heard the message? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know what to do. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You stand for him down here, he'll stand for you up there. Will you stand for him now? Right now. Give you an opportunity while we're praying. You step out of your seat, come to the front right now. Take your stand for him right now, down here, down here. Will you do that? We'll wait a few minutes. Nobody comes, we'll close. We'll wait a couple of minutes while the Lord's people are praying. You come on. You'll never know the meaning of Christmas. Do you know the one that was born on that day they're supposed to be commemorating? You'll never know what it's all about. I don't know how many presents you get. It won't substitute for the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Anybody step out. Maybe you're all saved this morning. I don't think so. God very rarely lays something hard like that. There isn't, isn't some rhyme or reason to it. Somebody here today. Is anybody here this morning who knows of an unsaved person that's in this building right now? I'm not going to ask you to point them out, but if you know of an unsaved person that's here today, would you raise your hand anywhere in the building? All right, thank you. Thank you. Three hands. Three hands. That'll be it. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I've told you. I've told you. I've told you the truth. You say, how do I know, Brother Ruckman? Come on, try it. Try it. See if I know what I'm talking about. Come on down here right now. Let, let Brother McGee have a word of prayer with you right now. We'll wait about one minute. God help you. God help you. I didn't expect a hundred people out here today, let alone unsaved people. Our Lord has spoken to you. You better come. With heads bowed, I want us to have us sing just the chorus, and then we're going to close. We're going to sing just the chorus with heads bowed and eyes closed. Why not now? Why not now? Why not come to Jesus now? And this will be your last chance, last chance this day, maybe the last chance this year, maybe the last chance of your life, I don't know. But let's sing it now. Why not now? Why not now, sinner? Come on. Why not now? If you will, come on. Step out. Why not now? God help you. 
Father, bless the message. May the Holy Spirit uh, confirm his word long after I'm through. May this word that's come from your book not return to thee void, but accomplish the purpose where do thou have sent it, and prosper in the thing that pleases thee. And I pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we want to thank you at this uh, season for salvation. And we're thankful, Father, whatever else happens, these things are fixed. And these eternal things are taken care of. And we're thankful and give you the glory for it in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Lord bless you and good morning.